So what I did is I just started snooping through that whole church. Well, it was one of the mornings, and uh, they weren't quite ready for us, and so normally we left about 8, and this time I think we left about 9 or 10, and so I thought, okay, there's a whole section, the children's section, I have not explored yet. And so I went through the nursery section, and their little toddlers, and they had beautiful signage and all this other stuff, and I went through it, and I was going through it, and I kept thinking, you know, they have security cameras, they've got signs up saying you're being watched, and all sorts of stuff, and I thought, eventually, someone's going to say something to me, eventually it has to happen. Well, it was a three-story building, and I was on the bottom floor, and I started making my way, and I was going to go up to the second level, where, like, the sixth and fifth grade group was, and as I started going up to this entry, they had these beautiful signs and TVs and everything directing you where to go, I came up, and I found myself on that opening lobby, surrounded by 30 Joplin police officers. <laughs> and they were looking at me like, who is this guy? And I came up, and in the midst of them, I just sort of looked around and I said, am I going to jail? <laughs> and one of the guys in charge said, they were putting on their guns at this exact same moment, and a couple of them, it wasn't just holsters, a couple of them had big guns, and they were putting on, and I thought, I'm just trespassing at worst. What are you people gonna do to me? And I found out later, one of them told me, he said, no, 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 we're not here for you. We don't even know who you are. Uh, we're here because we're doing an a, uh, emergency prepared response thing, sort of a terrorist thing. They were doing training, and they were meeting at the church because it was a central location. And I went, Because <laughs> I thought, how do I explain this to the men when I get back? And Mike has to bail me out of jail on a missions trip. Just imagine if we were out of the country. But if you're taking notes in the back of your newsletter, I tell you that to tell you this truth. Our one truth today I want you to get is this. Surprises take place when the norm is disrupted. Surprises take place when the norm is disrupted. It was many years ago before Isabel, our youngest, was born. And one of the biggest surprises I had in store for me is we took our kids, and Sandra was six months pregnant, we took them to Disneyland. Now, Nate was a young kid, and, and Katie was only, I think, about 10 or so, but we took him to Disneyland, and Isabel periodically will say, hey, I, have not, I didn't get to go to Disneyland, I want to be there, and I let her know, sweetheart, we're pro-life, you were at Disneyland. <laughs> your problem that you couldn't remember it is your problem. But one of the scariest events of Disneyland, the scariest ride that I experienced when we were there, it wasn't the roller coaster. It wasn't, and, and they have these amazing things like dinosaurs that look like they're coming alive, chasing you and everything. The ride that was the absolute scariest was about sound. And what they did with these professionals, knew what they were doing, they brought you in and you sat down, and all of a sudden, it went completely black. Not dark and, you know, at night you're sleeping and there's, no, completely sealed off by professionals. There was no light in that room. And I'm going to tell you something, it was the scariest thing because then they did a whole sound thing and showed you about how you can hear sound better when there's no other light. All I knew is I was scared because I could not see a thing. And in that moment, Nate was a little guy and he kind of got scared too and was crying. And I thought, oh, for Nate, I took out my cell phone and gave him a little light and, and he felt better. You know who it was for? It was really for me. <laughs> but one of the scariest rides of all time, complete darkness. Why is darkness so scary? If you're taking notes, let me give you three things about darkness. Why it's so scary? Because it's when people do their worst. Darkness is scary because it's when people do their worst. Hey, if you're like me and you grew up in the 80s and you're a teenager when the time was great and the clothes were cool, uh, one of the things in the 80s was the horror movies that came out. And every horror movie that never took place during a... Uh, during a bright daylight time. It always took place at night and there was always some girl in high heels running through the forest because that is what ladies wear in the forest, I thought, for the longest time was high heels. But it always took place in the middle of the night when it's completely dark. That is what people do. There were young people, listen, I don't want you to be in the bar scene. I don't want you to be part of it. And you will find very often that most bars are very dark and dimly lit because they don't want you, one, to see the floor, but secondly, it's when people do their worst. Secondly, why is dark scary? Because it's when we see no escape. When there is no escape, fear takes over. 
And when fear takes over, you will do things you never thought possibly. God did not call you to live a life in fear. He called you to live a life in faith. And lastly, number three, it's when we feel no hope. When it's completely dark, and we think there is no possible way of getting out. We fear that there is no hope for us. And so maybe that's you. Maybe that's you today. As I describe the darkness, you feel like there is no hope and the darkness is coming around you and slowly engulfing you. Or maybe for some of us, it describes a certain point in our life, a time and a place I have been to many times to jails, and I have visited people in jails, and I have visited people in emergency rooms, and I have visited people in post-op, and I have visited people when the doctors are saying, I'm not sure what's going to happen, and I have visited people when the hospice has been called in, and they don't know what's going to take place. I have found oftentimes that you find people with completely no hope, and if that is the moment when they decide to reevaluate their life. Hey, you get sentenced to 15 years in prison, you'll start reevaluating your decisions. You think God isn't real and you think God doesn't matter in your life? Hey, you walk into a doctor's office and sit down and they whip out your chart and they tell you it's the cancer word. And you'll start to find out real quick that you need God in your life. You start to think that God doesn't really matter in your family and there really is no point and purpose for all of this. You let your son come home in a police car and you'll start to look for your Bible real quick and realize, hey, I need God in my family. Because it is when the darkness kicks over Fear begins to build. People are doing their worst in darkness. Sometimes there seems like there's no escape, and it seems hopeless. But there is always hope for those who are in God's plan. There is always hope for those who are in God's plan. Maybe a very dark, it may be a very dark time in your life, but in the midst of those dark, scary moments, in the midst of when the doctor gives you a bad report. When your wife walks out on you, when the bank tells you they're coming to get the house, in the midst of those dark and scary moments, if you are in God's plan, there is always hope. In Luke chapter 23 in your Bible, in the middle of the crucifixion story, and by the way, I say story because it's a historical event. It's not an allegory. It doesn't represent redemption or type of thing. It was that God loved you and actually sent his son to die on a cross. It is as true historically that we mark time by the crucifixion of Jesus Christ. But in the midst of this story, what happens? Let me remind you. Surprises take place when the norm is disrupted. Look at verse 44. I'll read from the King James Version. And it was about the sixth hour. Now listen. The Jewish culture marked time. They began and started their day at daylight, which was basically 6 a.m. So when we say six hour in a Jewish calendar, in a Jewish time, we're talking 12 noon. That would be our time What right now. What happens? There is darkness over all the earth. Now, does it say over all of Jerusalem? It says no, over all the earth. May I suggest to you, I don't want to jump in and make an allegory and make an exaggeration of the word of God who may not be there. But the darkness didn't just cover the Jews because the darkness wasn't a Jew problem. The darkness didn't just cover Africa because it was an African problem. The darkness just didn't cover Europe because it was a European problem. It covered all of the earth because the darkness was an earthly problem. May I suggest to you that that darkness is a great picture of sin? Sin is not a problem that people on Skid Row have to deal with. It's the same problem that the people in Wall Street have to deal with. Sin is not a problem that your brother-in-law struggles with. No, sir, it's the problem that you struggle with. It is a problem because we are sinners separated from God. You are not a sinner because you sin. Get this, you sin because you're a sinner. Amen? That wasn't in any of my notes and my wife told me, you have to be quick today. Don't tell her. Verse 44, when? Until the ninth hour. That would be our 3 p.m. Verse 45, and the sun was darkened. Now some say it could have been an eclipse. Going by the Jewish calendar that they used, the lunar calendar, most experts would agree that that's probably not what happened. It wasn't an eclipse that took over, and an eclipse wouldn't cover the entire earth necessarily. It was God, in this passage right here, it was God giving us the smallest glimpse of his wrath. 
It was God showing us in a very tiny, subtle way of what his wrath is like. If you, we went to Joplin, and it was years after that tornado, and you could still see what that tornado had done to that town, and how it had tore up trees and just left a scar going right across that. And I think about that. If a tornado, one tornado was that devastating, that powerful, how powerful is the God who created the tornado? How powerful is the God? Listen, it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of an angry God. And that is why God sent his son, so that we would not have to. But let me remind you again, there is always hope for those who are in God's plan. And it is with this scripture, there are three plans being developed in the midst of darkness. In the midst of this darkness, there are three plans developing. Number one was a plan, a wasted life finds hope. Jesus is crucified, if you know the story, between two thieves. One was probably a career criminal. He had been bad his whole life, and he probably started stealing when he was young. He had done some horrible things, and he finally caught up with him. He was a bad guy from pretty much a childbirth. The other one... We don't know much about him, but many people believe that he was a young man who was in a, raised in a good home. Do some of you young people hear me? He was a young man who was raised in a good home. It was probably a God-fearing home, but something had happened in his life, I'll bet when he was a teenager, when he was a young person, that he rebelled and ran away from the decisions of his father, ran away from the character that his mother was trying to instill in him, and he ran away from it, and he finds himself on a cross being crucified. Young people, listen to me very careful. This may be simple, but this might be the best preaching you ever heard. You better listen to your mom and dad. It's the first promise. It's the first commandment with a promise in the Word of God. But look at verse 42, and we meet this man in the midst of no hope. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, he knows how to talk. He knows the churchy words to say. Remember me when thou comest into thy kingdom. He knows the right theology. He knows how to do it. Verse 43, and Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee today, Thou shalt be with me in paradise. You know what I learned real quickly? Just because you look the part doesn't mean you're in the family of God. Just because you have the right terminology, you know when to kneel or stand up, or you know when to say amen, or you know when to take the pastor to lunch, or you have the right Bible, or you wear the right tie, or your dress length is the right length. Just because you know the things of God does not mean you're in the family of God. This young man knew the talk, he knew the theology, but something was wrong with his heart. Young people, it is not a words of a prayer that gets you to heaven. It is with your heart and true confession. And you can look the part, and that's the problem. That's... Listen to me. That's the... That's the problem in churches today. Because we have enough people who look the part. Who don't do, I don't chew, and I don't smoke, and I don't go with girls who do, and they look the part. And I'm not picking them up off a skid row or at the drunk tank, and they have never gotten a DUI or anything, and they look the part, Pastor, but the problem is they have a head knowledge of who Jesus is and not a heart knowledge of who Jesus is. There will be enough people like this young man who will hear, hear from Jesus, depart from me, I never knew you. That is the scariest passage in the Bible. As a parent, this is one of the scariest passages because this young man was raised in a good home. He knew better. How did he get here, young people? None of that was in my notes, but I had to tell you this. Young people, life is short. Life is short. Don't waste it pursuing pleasure. Don't waste it pursuing getting high or getting drunk or getting some boy to notice you. Girls, boys are idiots. You don't need a boy. You need a man. But just because he's shaved doesn't mean he's a, boy, a man. It means he might just be a boy who shaves. You need a man with character and conviction because any dog can mate and, mate and reproduce another child. A man just becomes a father and stays in when it's a hard time. Girls, you don't need a boy. You need a man. Don't waste your time pursuing boys. Wait for God to bring the right man of God into your life. None of that was in my notes. The second man we find find a searching man finds truth. Look at verse 46. It must be this microphone because I don't usually get off this topic that bad. It's got to be the mic. 
I'll blame it on you. The searching man finds truth. Look at verse 46. And when Jesus had cried with a loud voice, he said, Father, into thy hands I commend my spirit. And having said this, he gave up the ghost. And when the centurion, this is a Roman soldier, the centurion had was over a hundred different other soldiers. He was a powerful man and saw that what, done, what was done, he glorified God saying, certainly this was a righteous man. In Matthew, he records this in verse 54. He says, truly, thou, this was the Son of God. And that question, what is Jesus, is a question I have for you today. What if it's true? What if Jesus was who he said he was? What if he really was God? What if it's true? What if he did rise from the grave on the third day? What if it's true? What if he was and he is, like he said, the only way to heaven? What if it's true? What if John 14, 6 is true? Jesus saith unto them, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man cometh unto the Father by me. What if it was true? If it's true, then you better accept Christ as your personal Savior. Because Jesus died for you and for my sin. And if it's true, you better accept the plan that Jesus has for your life. An atheist bets this. There is nothing. An atheist bets that there is nothing. But a believer puts his faith in Jesus Christ. And that is true. Now listen, sometimes it's very easy to misunderstand what a pastor says. I love this joke. A Baptist minister decided to use a visual demonstration to emphasize his Sunday sermon. So he took four worms and placed them in four separate jars. The first worm, he put in a jar of alcohol. The second worm, he put in a jar of uh, cigarette smoke. The third worm, he put in a jar of chocolate syrup. And the fourth worm, he put in a jar of good, clean soil. At the conclusion of his sermon, the minister reported the following results. The first worm and the alcohol was dead. The second worm and the cigarette smoke was dead. The third worm and the chocolate syrup was dead. And the fourth worm and the good, clean soil was alive and healthy. So the minister asked the congregation, what can you learn from this demonstration? A little old lady in the back raised her hand and stood up and she said this, as long as you drink, smoke, and eat chocolate, you won't have worms. <laughs> Very easy sometimes to understand what a pastor's trying to say. But what I want you to get today is this. The only truth that will set you free is the cross of Jesus Christ. And lastly, we're getting our kids to A's and candy. A plan for hope is accomplished. Look at the end of it in verse 45. And the veil of the temple was ripped in the midst of it. Matthew 21 records it as this. And behold, the veil of the temple was rent and twain from top to bottom. I want you to understand, if you've been in church long enough, you know that that veil that separated the Holy of Holies from everyone else, that only the high priest could go in and offer that sacrifice. That veil was a symbol. It, was a, it wasn't just a sheet. It, wasn't, it was thick. It was very difficult to tear. That veil was a symbol of the barrier between God and man. And only the high priest had the authority with the Lamb's blood to go into that Holy of Holies and make an offering for everyone's sin. And when Jesus gave up the ghost, it was not a coincidence that that veil ripped, not from top to bottom, but from bottom to top. It was not a coincidence because God was telling the world, now you can go into the Holy of Holies because Jesus was our high priest. Because Jesus was the lamb like the Old Testament lamb that they sacrificed. He was the lamb of God. And his death on the cross was our payment for sin. Right. Hebrews tell us that we have a high priest who makes intersection for us before God. That veil, the darkness, in the midst of all of it, there was hope. Hope. Because Sunday is coming. Amen.